For hundreds of years, philosophers, academics, and others have been studying learning to figure out how we humans can more effectively learn and teach. And as a result, there's a whole lot of learning theories out there. If you're a teacher or involved in the world of education, you may have heard of some of these. In the 1920s and 30s, people like Pavlov and Skinner talked about behaviorism, where knowledge is believed to exist outside the person and we learn through trial and error. The learner is a blank slate and must be provided with an experience to learn. Using repetition, positive and negative feedback, consequences and incentives, learning develops over time. With behaviorist theories, learning is measured based on observed change in behavior. Or there are cognitive theories where learning is based on people processing the information they receive rather than just responding to some external stimuli. Changes in behavior are observed, but only as an indicator of what's happening in the learner's head. Useful tools might be imagery, mnemonics, discussions, and linking concepts to those that they already know. Or there's constructivism where learners build new knowledge themselves based on prior knowledge or experiences that they've had in the past. Students actively construct knowledge instead of passively consuming it. Social constructivism emphasizes the role of social interactions between learners. Learning is thought to occur by students observing, mimicking, and practicing skills as modeled by a teacher, and then successfully applying the skills in a new context. With constructivism, the teacher becomes a facilitator who encourages and guides students as they work on real world problems. Teaching has strong links with philosophy, so ever since the days of Socrates, pedagogical and andragogical theories of learning and teaching have been developing and changing as the discipline has become better understood. There's a more recent iteration of these educational theories that pulls concepts from past theories and a range of new ideas. It's a little bit of learning by doing from behaviorism, a dash of discovery and discussion from cognition theories, and a whole lot of interaction, practice, and transferring skills from social constructivist theories. This learning theory is called Applied Learning, and it goes a little something like this. According to the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority, applied learning is the teaching of skills and knowledge in the context of real life experiences. Learners apply what they have learnt by doing, experiencing, or relating it to the real world. It's an approach which contextualizes learning in a way which empowers and motivates students while assisting them to develop key skills and knowledge required for employment, further education, and active participation in their communities. In this definition, we can see aspects of behaviorism, cognition, and constructivist theories. In the vetting schools and TAFE context, an applied learning approach can connect students to employers, provide authentic workplace-based experiences, and also help to increase year 12 retention rates. For a number of reasons, including government policy and low youth employment rates, young people have been staying in school longer. A new approach was needed to address students who may have otherwise become disengaged with education or might be considered at risk. Blake in 2007 said, this change in context has resulted in an applied learning pedagogy to cater for the increasing number of students who are completing year 12. As a result, in 2002, the Victorian Certificate of Applied Learning or VCAL was introduced for students vet in schools. In 2004, the Victorian Qualifications Authority created eight applied learning principles that give a framework for how the concept of applied learning could be incorporated into teaching. Then in 2005, a graduate diploma of applied learning was offered by Deakin University in Geelong. Following, a range of other universities offered similar qualifications throughout the country and also internationally. In this presentation, I'll explore the theoretical foundation of applied learning and how it relates to other learning theories. I'll provide an overview of the eight principles. I'll expand on their meaning in relation to literature and I'll provide examples of how applied learning theories can be used and how they relate to my own teaching and learning experiences. I'll provide ideas on how applied learning principles and strategies could be incorporated into my own organisation. And I'll explore how these principles are connected to the Australian teaching standards.
Before we jump in in detail, here are the eight principles that will guide your lesson plans and help you interact with your students and provide strategies for you to motivate and engage with real-world tasks and skills. Many teachers will be able to recognize and relate to these principles in their own teaching. So the first one is start where the learners are at. Number two, negotiate the curriculum. Number three, share knowledge. Number four, connect with communities and real life experiences. Number five, build resilience, confidence and self-worth. Number six, integrate learning. Number seven, promote diversity of learning styles and methods. And number eight, assess appropriately. All right, well, let's jump in in detail. Principle one is start where the learners are at. To do this, we really need to get to know our students. What motivates them? Why have they enrolled in your course? What do they want to achieve at the end of their learning? What do they already know? And how can we build upon their knowledge effectively? Another great way to connect is to know their interests outside of school. What are their hobbies? Because knowing this can help us teach in a way that they can relate to. Knowles, Halton and Swanson in 2011 said, any situation in which the participants' experiences are ignored or devalued will be perceived as rejecting not only their experience, but rejecting them as a person. So principle one goes a little bit deeper than that. What were their past experiences like at school? Well, they may be labelled a bad student um, and as a result, hated school. What does this mean? What's their background? Um, are they a mature uh, student returning to, a, to school to go back to the workforce? Are they a young parent with other responsibilities outside of school? In 1988, Bald said, students will vary their readiness to benefit from any given approach, partly as a result of their prior educational experiences and partly as a, as a result of their reason for learning. Do they have linguistic, cultural, religious or socioeconomic barriers in their way? Now this brings up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Each level needs to be addressed to achieve effective learning and to build confidence and self-worth in the learner. Have they had breakfast? Level one. Some schools have implemented uh, breakfast programs to address this. Do they feel safe at home? Do they feel safe in the learning environment? Do they have friends or are they connected to the workforce or to the, the simulated learning environment? As we'll see later, the applied learning principles talk about building self-worth in the student. So principle one um, can map to the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers. Number one, knowing the student and how they learn. Um, and this could be 1.1, uh, the physical, social and inter intellectual development and characteristics of students. Uh, 1.2, understanding how the students learn. Um, it can also uh, link to standard number four. Uh, which is to create and maintain a supportive and safe learning environment. Applied learning principle number two. Negotiate the curriculum. Engage in a dialogue with learners about their curriculum. Working in VET is a very structured and regulated environment. We teach out of training packs that have qualifications and a set number of core and elective units. However, there are some things that we can change. We can change the way we deliver. We can appeal to a range of learning styles. We can use things like problem-based learning, or we can change the order we teach in, or we can teach units in a holistic fashion. We can even give students a choice of electives. This is super handy if you've got a trainee, so they can pick electives that match what they do in the job. We can change how the room is set up, and we can even have some scope in changing how our students are assessed. In 1988, Baud said a fundamental purpose of education is to develop in individuals the ability to make their own decisions about what they think and do. And Brunner in 1963 said that material that is organised in terms of a person's own interest is more likely to be memorable. Principle number two maps to Australian Professional Standards for Teachers Principle one, know the student and how they learn. And principle three, plan and implement effective teaching and learning. 
Applied learning principle number three is share knowledge. Recognize the knowledge learners bring to the learning environment. Learners all come with something. It could just be an interest in the subject, or it could be a range of experiences and knowledge that they've gathered throughout their working life. Even if what they have doesn't directly relate to the subject you're teaching, they may have transferable knowledge or something you can pivot off. Following the football can be used to talk about statistics, which can be used to talk about spreadsheets and mathematics and formula. People are defined by their experiences. As mentioned before, Knowles, Halton and Swanson in 2011 said, if participants' experiences are ignored, then it's like rejecting them as a person. In 2015, they said, the richest resource for learning resides in the adult learners themselves. So how can we use students' existing knowledge in the classroom. Well, we can have classroom discussions. Uh, a technique I've used is I've had students uh, mentoring or pairing up or students teaching other students. Um, we can use group work. We can use problem-based approaches. Um, so a lot of these techniques are very similar to social constructivism and this uh, applied learning principle links closely to applied learning principle one. Brian Aspinall, a professional speaker on education who's given a number of TED Talks on education, said that if I've learnt anything as a teacher, it is that every student in my class knows something that I don't. This principle links to Australian Professional Standards for Teachers, number three, uh, which is plan and implement effective teaching and learning, and also number four, which is create and maintain supportive and safe learning environment. Applied Learning Principle 4 is connect with communities and real life experiences. And to me, this is the heart of, uh, of teaching VET. It builds trust and confidence with the local industry. So this is not only in the teacher, but this is also in the school or the TAFE, becoming part of the community um, and building that, building that relationship between, between industry and between the school. Um, so that means that it blurs the line between school, work and the rest of the world so that the students just see um, the workplace as, as an extension of what they've done at school, not a whole different world. And this allows us to provide authentic experiences for the students. So what they're learning in the context of their VET training is actually what happens in the workplace. So how can we achieve this? We can use workplace visits. We can set up simulated work environments or simulated businesses at our place of training. Um, students can go out on, on work placements or industry visits. And teachers can do the same. They can go out on industry visits and, uh, and placements as well. Um, Knowles in 2015 said that adults are motivated to learn to the extent that they perceive that the learning will help them perform a task or deal with problems that they confront in real life situations. And to me, that's what principle four is all about. So this principle maps to the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers number seven, which is to engage professionally with colleagues, uh, parents, carers, and the community. Applied learning principle number five is build resilience confidence and self-worth consider the whole person in 1999 itten said if a student is not feeling self-worth they will not engage in learning as learning involves the entire person now this links back to applied learning principle number one start where the learners are at so knowing a little bit about the background of our students really helps us to uh, to build those students up to uh, build their confidence and self-worth um, this links back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we spoke about earlier. Um, building confidence and self-worth is all about making connections. So this might be connections with other students in the class and sharing their knowledge. Uh, or this might be making that link between what the tasks, what tasks they complete in the simulated work environment or in the classroom and how that links to tasks that happen in the real world and being allowed to fail as well. 
Um, students can transfer skills from a simulated work environment to the workplace and, and build up their confidence and resilience as they, as they problem solve and work their way through the tasks. So some habits of successful people always seem to be things around um, successful people take action. They have a positive attitude. They, they share in their success and they also reflect upon and share in their failings. Um, successful people will persevere when faced with obstacles and always try to pursue their own goals. So a lot of the time in my practice, I'm, I'm trying to develop this confidence and self-worth as my students work through the simulated work environment tasks and then transfer that knowledge to uh, maybe a, a work placement situation or, or um, somewhere in the real world. So this principle maps to Australian Professional Standards for Teachers, um, standard number one, where we know our students, which is very similar to applied learning principle number one. And it also links to creating and maintaining a supportive and, and safe learning environment. Um, again, that touches on Maslow's hierarchy of needs where, where safety is, is, is low on the scale. Applied learning principle number six is integrate learning, the whole task and the whole person. In life, we use a range of skills and knowledge. Learning should reflect the integration that occurs in real life tasks. Now, we all deal with performance criteria and evidence knowledge, and we hope to teach our students effective uh, problem-solving skills so that they might overcome obstacles and, and we might um, hope to teach them effective communication skills so that they can communicate in the workplace and, and share their knowledge. Um, so to do this, we can actually create some holistic tasks or holistic assessments that reflect what happens day-to-day -day in the workplace. Knowles, Holton and Swanson said, students learn new knowledge understanding skills, values, and attitudes most effectively when they are presented in the context of application to real life situations. And as we all know, real life situations are unpredictable. We have no control over the day-to-day -day happenings in most workplaces and students need to learn resilience and uh, the ability to problem solve to get through a day at work. So we don't necessarily need to teach our units in a particular order or any order at all. Learning is a lifelong process and it, it goes uh, not just at school, it continues on into the workplace. So this uh, Applied Learning Principle 6 can be mapped to the Professional Standards for Teachers um, Standard 1, which is knowing how our uh, students learn. Number 3, plan and implement effective teaching and learning. And number four, create and maintain a supportive and safe learning environment. And this principle echoes back to some earlier principles we've discussed. Applied Learning Principle 7 is promote diversity of learning styles and methods. Everyone learns differently, except that different learning styles require different learning and teaching methods, but value experiential, practical, and hands-on ways of learning. So learning is in the doing, which reinforces the knowledge with the practical tasks. So different learning styles I like to think of uh, with the five senses we have. We have auditory learners who like to hear things. We have tactile learners who like to touch things and have a go. We have people that like to see things happen and be demonstrated before they give it a go. And the other two senses, smell and taste, uh, can be pretty useful in certain industries as well. Digital content gives students agency. Learners are not defined by their ability to read and write. So in the past, I've provided students with uh, text digitally that they can have the computer read to them if needed, or they can enlarge the font if needed. Um, there, I've produced videos and audio recordings to, um, to appeal to the auditory learners and the visual learners. And also some interactions where students can um, see it happening or, or even maybe touch it in certain situations. In 1999, Itton said the teacher cannot simply depend upon a lecture alone approach and repeat it year in, year out. The teacher must assess the learning needs of the students, select appropriate teaching strategies to meet these students' needs, and be willing to use multiple strategies to make it an educational experience. 
In 2007, Blake said the students' learning temperaments have the potential to generate a poor fit with the learning environment. So that's why we need to promote a diversity of learning styles and methods in our teaching. Now, Principle 7 can map to the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers, number one, where we know how our students learn, and uh, Standard 3, where we can plan and implement effective teaching and learning. And finally, Applied Learning Principle number eight is Assess Appropriately. Use the assessment method that best fits the learning content and context. So different assessment methods you may have come across might include observations, projects where the students build something or create something, quizzes that you can use to assess knowledge, and documentation where the students might need to document a process or an interaction with a client. Now it's important that these are real world tasks in a real world context. So having a student write an essay about playing the piano is not as effective as a student actually performing a piece on the piano. In 1999, Eaton said it is not sufficient that students master the content if they do not understand how to apply this in the real world. So your assessment tasks need to be um, not contrived and authentic and things that actually happen in the workplace. And as a result, you may need to be flexible with the way you conduct your assessment. You may need to adjust the time. You may need to uh, reasonably adjust the, uh, the criteria. Um, and Dushul in 1997 said, an appropriate assessment should allow the students to demonstrate their ability in the context of real world situations and seamlessly integrate it with the activity. So that means it shouldn't be contrived. It should be authentic and part of the day-to-day -day work practices. Principle 8 can map to the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers uh, Standard 5, which is assess, provide feedback and report on student learning. So that got me thinking, how can I more effectively incorporate these principles into my own teaching? I'm currently teaching across two different contexts, vetting schools with year 11 and 12 students and TAFE with adults doing high qualifications. But there's a common thread between what I'd like to achieve. I'd like to create closer links with the community and industry, which is applied learning principle number four. This will mean my students will have better networking opportunities and better chances to find some real world authentic work placements. I'd like to provide opportunities for students to personally and professionally develop, which is applied learning principle five and six, which is taking into account the whole person and the whole task. With input from local businesses, I'd like to create and develop my simulated workplace that gives students the opportunity to develop and practice skills in an authentic environment with input from industry. And this is applied learning principle number seven. And I'd like to develop assessments that more closely reflect what happens in the workplace and that are based on spontaneous events that occur rather than set deadlines. So I imagine these things will take place in my simulated workplace or while the students are out on work placement. This aligns with the applied learning principle number eight. So putting it all together, the applied learning principles provide a reliable framework for teaching. It's a student-centered model based on experiential learning. It puts value in creating strong links with the community and workplaces. It's focused on and values the whole person and the whole task. And it aims to build confidence and self-worth in students. According to the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority, applied learning is an approach that contextualizes learning in a way to empower and motivate students while developing the key skills and knowledge required for employment, further education, and active participation in their communities. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on an overview of the applied learning principles. My name's Marcus Winwood. Please take some time to fill out the feedback form found on the website.